tonight, but it is worth it. Well, I love singing out. Uh, those are great songs. Uh, those Christmas songs, like Brother Bob said, those are worship songs. And if, if you don't sing those songs with a heart of worship, you're missing out. If you're just singing them because it's Christmas songs and that's what we're supposed to do, yeah, that's fun, but you're missing out on the joy. You're missing out on uh, returning praise back to the one who deserves and who is worthy of our praise. And to sing of his coming to this earth the first time is, is quite a, uh, a privilege of ours to worship him with our songs as we did tonight. And I thank Brother Bob for leading us in that time of singing tonight as we could worship Jesus tonight. And uh, I don't know about you, but I'm glad he came the first time, but I'm really looking forward to his second coming and looking forward to when he comes again and meet, we meet him in the air. And the Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And I can't wait for that, but I'm sure glad he came the first time so that he could uh, save my soul. And I hope you uh, know Jesus Christ as your Savior tonight. Boy, we've been made to sit in heavenly places already tonight. I'm so thankful for that. Well, John chapter 3 will conclude the series tonight on the subject, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And tonight, we're going to look, we're in John chapter 3, we're going to look at Nicodemus. And uh, Nicodemus was uh, just like you and I and everybody else that's been born into this world, except for Jesus. Nicodemus was a sinner. And uh, this is a type of sinner, though, that's a little different uh, than the people that we've looked at in the past. In the past couple of weeks, as we've studied this topic, first of all, we looked at a, uh, the, the woman at the well. Or first of all, we looked at Levi. Uh, Levi, Matthew, when uh, Jesus called him out of the life of collecting taxes and called him to be a follower. And we saw that uh, Levi went to follow Jesus and, and he became a follower of Christ and actually an author of one of the books in the Bible. And so uh, what, a, what an incredible turn we saw there from a man who was a, a known sinner, a, a, a tax collector, a publican, uh, the kind of people that uh, no one liked because they were thieves and they stole from the common man. And so we saw quite a transformation in lifestyle when Matthew got saved. And then we saw the woman at the well, a woman who Jesus revealed had five husbands in, in her, and, and then she was living with one who wasn't her husband. And so we find another person who was a, a great sinner, someone who knew, uh, who had lots of sins that were obvious to everyone. And we saw her transformation when she did drink of that, that living water that made her live forever. She, she come to know Christ as Savior. And, and we saw that she went out into her own town and led many to Christ. And then we saw the woman with the alabaster box, the woman who came to Simon the Pharisee's house to worship Jesus. And a woman who the Bible records her sins were many. And uh, the people in that house that day knew what kind of a woman they were. Remember the Pharisee said, if he knew what kind of a woman this was, he wouldn't allow her to touch him. This woman was known for her sin, yet she had her sins forgiven by Jesus Christ. The people we've studied to this point all looked like sinners. When you would look at their life or their lifestyle or the decisions they made, just from observation, you could say, well, they're they're not close to the Lord. They're not living a godly life. It was easy to see the outside that they were living in opposition to the word of God. But you know, you can't judge a book by its cover. The eternal destination of a soul has nothing to do with what it looks like on the outside. We must be careful because the more religious we become, the more likely we are to look like we're spiritual. While our hearts may be as cold as ice, church people who have no real relationship with Jesus practice what many are calling today churchianity. They don't really have a relationship with the Lord, but they're good at church. They know how to look like a Christian, talk like a Christian, and pose like a Christian, but they and God know that their heart is far from Him. Many of the Pharisees seem to be this way. You remember in the, in the scriptures, in the book of Matthew, Jesus denounced woe upon the Pharisees in a clear and bold way because of their hypocrisy. And that's found in Matthew 23. Now, one of the things that Jesus said, listen carefully to this. One of the things that Jesus said to them in Matthew 23, 27 through 28 is, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Strong words 
from the Lord Jesus to the Pharisees in those days. You see, they looked like they had it all together on the outside. But inside, spiritually, they were tore up. There are many people who attend church every single time the door is open, and this is their testimony. So we learn that we can't judge a book by its cover. And tonight we're going to look at one of the Pharisees who had sincere questions for Jesus and appears to become a follower, or at least a believer in Jesus. You know, the truth is that we've all sinned and we all need Christ regardless of our outward appearances. Sometimes I just wish that we would just be truthful and honest with each other. And when somebody says, brother, how you doing today? Instead of saying, great, how are you? We'd say, you know what, not so hot. You know, but our outward appearances so many times really don't reflect what's going on inside. The question tonight for us is this. Will we love all people no matter their appearance or background? Will we love all people no matter their appearance or background. Because we've seen some that were pretty obvious. When they walked in a room, everybody knew who they were and what they'd been up to. But tonight we're going to look at a guy who looked like he had it all together, but his heart was in the same condition as those who did not look like they had it all together. All right, let's look at the Bible here tonight. John chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, we'll read through verse number 20. The Bible says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth. And thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, And you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And finally in verse 21, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Let's pray tonight. Father, we thank you for this word we've read tonight and we thank you that uh, Lord you've given us a yet another example of the love of God the sacrifice of Jesus and how to love those who need him Lord I pray that you would still our hearts and our minds tonight that we wouldn't be distracted but Lord that we'd be focused in on your word and Lord most importantly that we'd be intently listening to the Holy Spirit as he speaks to our hearts Lord hide me We want to elevate and magnify you. I pray that people would see you tonight and that they would hear your spirit tonight. And Lord, I pray that tonight as you do your work in our hearts, 
that we'll indeed see how Jesus dealt with this man, Nicodemus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So we read here that Jesus had his conversation with Nicodemus, who the Bible tells us right off the bat in chapter 3, verse 1, that he was a Pharisee. Who are the Pharisees anyway? Well, the Pharisees were a part of the Jewish leadership that were the guardians of the observances and the rites and ceremonies. They, uh, they enjoyed the title of Pharisee and were pious, even separating themselves from the common people or what many call the lay people. They did, however, have some correct beliefs uh, that were not shared by other members of the Jewish leadership. Namely, they believed uh, in the eternality of the soul, they believed in the resurrection of the body, and they believed in angels. The Pharisees were a group of people who were very pious and loved having their titles called. They liked the title of Pharisee. They enjoyed that. You know, this particular Pharisee, Nicodemus, is also mentioned in John 7.50 and in John 19.39. Both times, interestingly, it mentions him as the one who came to Jesus by night. So all three times we read about Nicodemus, we read that he came to Jesus by night. Uh, John 7.50 says that it was uh, in context, the Pharisees were discussing Jesus and what they would do to him. And Nicodemus seems to come to Jesus' defense and says, we can't do some of the things we're talking to to this man. He hasn't really done anything. In John 19.39, when it mentions Nicodemus, he was present at Jesus' death and actually brought myrrh and aloes to prepare his body for burial. So it seems like he came with Joseph of Arimathea. It seems like he became a believer in Jesus. Now, tonight as we notice these things, uh, this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, there's three things I think that stand out. Now, we understand that John 3 is an incredible passage for salvation and for the soul and, and how you have to be born again and, and what that means and how Jesus has to be lifted up and how that uh, God loved the world and how he sent his son not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. We understand that's a passage concerning salvation. But tonight I want to look at it from a different perspective, if you will. I want to look at it from the perspective of how Jesus dealt with a Pharisee. How, we saw how he dealt with the people who were obvious sinners, like we talked about. The compassion that he had for them. The love that he had for them. And, and how would he treat a person whom he called in a group, in generality, a, a, a hypocrite, Blind guides, serpents. I mean, he called them a lot of things. How would he deal with a person who was religious but lost? And I hope that as we see how Jesus dealt with them, it'll help us and how we deal with people who are religious but lost. I'm sure that all of us know of people who are religious people. They may go to church every week or they go to church every day. I know a man, in fact, you probably know of this man. I read his book, uh, uh, one of the, the coach for the University of Kentucky, John Calipari. He wrote in his book that he goes to mass every day. Every day. Could you imagine going to church every day? I can't, okay? I'm the preacher and I can't imagine going to church. I can't imagine trying to prepare a message for every day. You know, that's enough to do one for the, do two for the weekend. But listen, going to church every day. There's a lot of religious people out there. People who are religiously trying to, to earn their way to heaven, earn their way to favor with God. But the truth of the matter is there's a lot of religious people who are lost. Doesn't mean all religious people are lost. Don't, don't get that wrong either. But there are a lot of religious people who are lost. How would Jesus deal with a religious man who is lost? Well, let's take a look at it here. Number one, how do we love those who are lost? How do we love the religious? Well, number one, Jesus, and in context, people who care for others, listen. People who care for others, listen. Isn't that just part of it? Isn't that, I mean, we know that from life, that if you care about people, you have a listening ear. You know, I think um, just this week, I had a conversation with my doctor. He's a great doctor. I, I love him. He's incredible. He's a, he's a a very personal man. He's, uh, his bedside manner is as good as his technical um, doctoring, you know, because that's a technical term. But uh, he's as good as a person as he is a doctor, if you know what I mean. He doesn't just blow you off and listen to you and walk out the door. He takes time to listen. And I called Jamie. I said, I talked to the doctor, and I want to tell you, he just, I love it. He just listens. He doesn't cut you off and say, well, this is what we're going to do. I called it and go. He listens. And I love that about it. That's why I think he's a good doctor. You know, people who care about others, listen. If you've got a doctor who will listen to you, you've got a good one. 
If you've got a pastor who will listen to you, you've got a good one. I don't know, so don't vote, all right? We're not taking a vote tonight. Tell me that in private, okay? If you've got a friend who will listen to you, you've got a good friend. If you've got a parent or a sibling who will listen, you, they're good. People who listen care about others. And we notice that Jesus, who know, literally knows everything, he literally knows everything. He knew Nicodemus' heart. He knew his motivation for coming. He knew what he knew and didn't know. And yet he took the time to let Nicodemus ask questions. He listened. He wasn't intimidated by the questions. Jesus didn't perceive the questions as an attack on the truth. He saw the questions as an opportunity to share the truth. Now listen, we're going to have to be ready as Christians. We see what's going on in our world today. The choices that many are making in their lifestyle and the choices that many are making uh, just in the day-to-day -day activities. And what I'm talking about is the sin that's going on in the world. And by the way, the world's always been bad. I want to always say that as a, as a caveat. The world has always been bad. Um, our media has allowed us to see a lot more of it nowadays. But, but the world, it's, it's bad. We're getting a clear picture of it now, just how bad the world is. But friends, you and I need to be ready. Listen to this. We are concerned as a nation, as we should be, with refugees coming to this country who may be up to no good. And I hope that our government leaders take that seriously. However, you and I have a responsibility to listen to this. This is going to happen. If the Lord tarries, this is going to happen. There is going to be a spiritual group of refugees, follow me, who are entering into a a world, a lifestyle of sin. And guess what they're going to find out? What all of us find out. Sin is pleasurable for a season, isn't it? It's fun for a little while. It, it's great for a time, but then payday comes. And then the consequences of sin, they start to stack up. And eventually we find out it's not worth it. There has to be more to life than what I'm doing right now. And listen, we're going to have spiritual refugees that are going to come out of a movement in America. And they're going to be looking for hope. And they're going to be looking for answers. And let me tell you, you know who people call when they're looking for hope and answers? They call the church. We take calls all week. All week we have people calling. They need this. They need that. They need prayer. They need food. They need clothing. They need money. All the time people call because they perceive church as a place where people should care. And they're right. Church is a place where people should care. But we need to be ready for the spiritual refugees who are coming because they will. They're going to find out that sin's not worth it and they're going to be looking for something. And you and I can either look at them like Jesus looked at Nicodemus and listen and give them the time of day, or we can see their questions and interests as an attack on the truth and turn them away. Many times when we have questions, we feel defensive. And as a believer in Jesus, when people have questions, we should see that as an opportunity to share the truth with them, to share the truth of Jesus with them, to share the truth of sin and forgiveness, the whole story. We got to be ready for that. You know, listening requires humility. We have to really care and not just say we do. Instead of saying, told you so, we need to lovingly lead them to Christ. Jude 22 says, and if some have compassion, making a difference. We will make a difference in this world with compassion. It also will require sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. John 16, 13 says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will shew you things to come. Listen, he, the Holy Spirit of God within us will guide us in all truth. We're going to have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit when people have questions. He will guide us with the answers. He'll give us what we need to help others. Why? Because he loves them more than we do. And he'll give us what we need if we're willing. You know, loving people, listening to people is going to require accountability, listen, for knowing why we believe what we believe. There's a lot of Christians who can tell you what they believe and you ask them why, they're, they'll either stare at you or they'll say, well, somebody told me. We need to know what the book says. We need to know why we believe what we believe. Listen, there's a lot of Baptist distinctives. A lot of things that separate Baptists from other denominations. That's great. 
Obviously, if there wasn't, we wouldn't have denominations. But there's distinctives. There's things that particular Baptist believes that, that other people don't hold to. And, and we could go down the line. B stands for this. A stands for this. P stands for this. And we go down. That's what it means, brother. Well, why do you believe that? Because uh, my pastor told me. That's not going to cut it. We need to be able to show them that's God's word. This is the truth from the Bible. This is why this is. It's going to require us to be accountable to know why we believe what we believe and not just what we believe. Because people who are inquisitive will keep asking, why do you believe that? Well, the pastor told me, why does he believe that? We've got to know. We've got to know. And so questions, we can't be offended by them. We can't take the defense on the questions we have to see them as an opportunity. We have to know the truth for ourselves. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Isn't it a shame when people ask us why we believe what we believe and we don't know? So that's why we need to study. I had a real lesson in this when I was a teenager. Uh, our youth pastor, he was an engineer at a bearings plant in Mason. And uh, he would uh, get uh, some of us teenagers summer jobs there to work in the factories, basically pulling orders. When they would order bearings, we'd put them in a box and ship them out. And uh, there was a couple of other teenagers I was working with, and I would try to witness to them throughout the day, and they had a lot of questions for me. And I remember I would go to uh, my youth pastor's desk in there in his office, and I would write down, uh, where's the verse for this, and where's the verse for that, and where's the wor verse for that, and I'd leave it on his desk. And one time he came back out to the break room and he, he, he kind of took it over and he got all the verses and I said, yeah, that's great, you know. And, and then I, I kept doing that. People would ask more questions and I kept leaving notes. And you know what he did eventually? He stopped telling me the answers. And I thought, at first, I thought, well, that's harsh. I need help here, man. You know, I'm, I'm out here on the battlefront for Jesus, you know. And, Come on, man, give me the answers. And then, then the Holy Spirit got in my heart, got a hold of my heart and said, you need to know why. You're not always going to have your youth pastor 30 feet away in an office to bail you out. And so those conversations became a lot less frequent while I was trying to learn why I believed what I believe. But we as believers, we have to know why. We have to love people no matter their appearance or background. And while some people we're going to encounter are going to look like sinners and they're going to have obvious needs, there are going to be some people who are religious but lost. And, and when they ask questions, we've got to be willing to to listen. Jesus, listen. Look at verse 2. Then came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus tells him in verse 3, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you got to be born again. Verse 4, he says, how can, this, how can a man be old, born when he is old? Can he understand? There's two questions there. Jesus answers his questions. Verse 9, then he just comes back with in general. How can this be? And Jesus gives them the answers. Don't see questions as an attack on the truth. See them as an opportunity to share the truth. So number one, people who care, listen. Will we be good listeners? Number two, people who care for others share the truth. They share the truth. Notice what Jesus did in verses 3, 5 through 8, and then 10 through 21. He doesn't sugarcoat it. He doesn't cookie coat it. He just goes straight through and tells them, here's exactly what it is. This is the truth. Right off the bat, verse 3, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except, that's exceptional, that's one, one way, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. Very narrow parameters. Jesus didn't say, well, you got to come to church, or well, you got to be good. He said there's one way, and, and notice his, the greatest need for Nicodemus was not, boy, you're a good miracle worker. The greatest need for Nicodemus was his soul. And Jesus got right to the point. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse number seven, Jesus said, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. People who care for others share the truth. And as hard as it is to do that sometime, to share the truth, if we're going to be right, we need to share the truth. He shared the truth about eternity. Notice it wasn't about church. Our first message is not about Central Baptist Church. I believe we have a good church. You believe, I hope we have a good church. But that, this church cannot save them. Now, we can help them once they're saved. We can help them come to Jesus. But it's not about this church. It's about salvation. It's about Jesus Christ. They have to be born again. That's why when on outreach, when we write letters and bags and door hangers, they all have a gospel witness to them. 
We ought to not give out a, a, an invitation to church without a gospel witness attached to it. Why? Because it's not about the church, it's about Jesus Christ. That's our first message. And Jesus dealt with the greatest need of his heart, and the greatest need of his heart was salvation. So we need to deal with the greatest need, and that's not church, it's salvation. Notice Jesus wasn't telling him about being good. Listen, there's lots of good people. There's lots of church goers. But it's not the same as being saved. It's not the same as being born again. We need to quit thinking that all people who go to church or are good folks are just like us. And I don't mean that to come across negative toward them. What I mean it to say is, well, if they're good, then they're fine. No. We all need Jesus Christ. Just being a churchgoer doesn't save your soul. We must share the truth, and the truth is Jesus saves. You know, now talking about church can be a good icebreaker, but the message isn't about going to church or belonging to the church. The message is you must be born again. Now, many religious people believe that going to church and being righteous before God are the same. That somehow our sins can be atoned for by simply being present at an address. Or that being in a build, building on a particular day can wash away our sins. I want us to look at a couple passages of Scripture. Look at Revelation chapter 1 with me. Turn to Revelation 1. The first message is that Jesus saves. You must be born again. We have to share the truth. The good news is not that there's a church down the street. The good news is there's a Savior in heaven. Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. Revelation 1 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Did you see that? How do we have our sins washed away? With the blood of Jesus Christ, not going to church. Now, other side of the Bible, Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. Jesus shed his blood on the cross for the sins of the world. But just because Jesus died, was buried, and rose again doesn't mean that everybody's going to heaven. There's a responsibility. And here we see the first um, look, the first type of that responsibility in Exodus 12, beginning in verse 1. Follow me now. Don't lose me on this. Exodus 12, 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Passover. They shall kill the lamb in the evening. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. Remember? They strike it on the two side posts and they strike it on the top post that makes the cross. Okay? It's a type. What are you saying, Pastor Keller? Skip down to verse 13. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. What are you saying? If they would have just slit the neck of that lamb and eaten it and let the blood just run, run wherever it ran and they didn't strike it on the doorpost, what would have happened to them that night? The firstborn what? Would have died. Because the blood was not applied. You see that? The blood was shed, but it wasn't applied. It had to be applied. Jesus shed his blood. And it's not, listen, just everybody, well, Jesus died for everybody, so everybody's going to heaven. No, 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 no. Jesus did die for everybody, but the blood has to be applied. Now, back over to John 1. Jesus 
was the perfect lamb of God. He shed his blood. He died on the cross for sins. Listen to this very carefully now. This is why we believe what we believe. His blood is what washes away our sins, but how? Is it just wash away the sins of everybody in the world because he died? No. John 1, 12. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. You have to receive him. You have to have the blood applied to your account. You have to have the blood applied to you. It's not just enough that he died. You have to have it applied to you, sir or ma'am. We have to share the truth. You see, we've gotten soft in a lot of Christian circles with, well, God loves everybody. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. A pastor named Rob Bell wrote a book uh, called, uh, I forget what it's called, but it basically what it comes down to is there's no such thing as hell, or if there is, God would not send people there. And he gives reasons why he believes that's a fact. Everybody's going to be fine in the end. It's called love wins. It's called love wins. In the end, everybody's going to be fine. Love wins. Friends, that's heresy. That is heresy. The blood has to be applied. As many as received him, to them give you the power. Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth. If it's not applied, if it's not received, if it's not accepted, that soul will still find an eternity in hell. We have to share the truth in love. Jesus shared the truth with Nicodemus that he must be born again. It's not about church or being good. It's about Jesus and the person making Jesus their personal Savior. Third and finally tonight, John chapter 3 We saw that people who care for others listen. Number one. Number two, we saw that people who care for others share the truth. And number three tonight, people who care for others show personal interest. Personal interest. Notice the times that Jesus uses the terms thee and thou when speaking to Nicodemus. Verse three, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Verse five, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Look at uh, verse 8, the wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, uh, but canst not tell whence it cometh, or whether it goeth, so is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Verse uh, number 10, art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things. Verse 11, verily, verily, I say unto thee. Jesus was personal with Nicodemus. He made it a one-on-one thing. He made it something that was personal to that man as an individual. Let's be reminded, the Holy Spirit does the convicting. Intimidation or scare tactics might produce an emotional decision to relieve the fear, but man cannot match the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. John chapter 3 and verse 8 tells us, Now, we don't know when and how the Spirit of God is going to move, but He moves. And you and I don't control that. He does. You can't sing enough songs, you can't speak in enough languages to get the Holy Spirit of God to move. He chooses. It's your and I responsibility to share the truth. Be personal, but don't mistake being personal for trying to intimidate someone into being saved. It's our job to share the truth personally and lovingly and God's job to convict and save. But we must be personal. Turn to Proverbs 27 quickly. Proverbs 27. You know this is the book of wisdom. Wise ways to live, wise sayings. Listen to what wisdom says about being personal. Proverbs 27, 19. Proverbs 27, 19. It says, as in water, faith answereth to face, so the heart of man to man. What's the best right way to reach a man? With the heart. Heart to heart is the best way to reach somebody. Heart to heart, one on one. Be real, be personal, be loving, be compassionate, and you can reach people. You've heard this saying, and I may butcher it, but people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. You could have the whole Bible memorized, but if you do it with a mean spirit, 
What does that gain us? What does that gain them? Love. Sharing the truth in love. You know, people can tell if we're just doing our job. Hello, I'm Phil. I'm from Central Baptist Church. If you were to die today, are you 100% sure you go to heaven? Then what am I? I'm the religious nut who's knocking on their door, who's bothering them because they're trying to have supper. People can tell when we care. People can tell when we're really interested in them. And whether or not they respond to us, that's not our decision. We're just supposed to tell them the truth in love. Having the right motivation, the right heart, going heart to heart with empathy and compassion. Don't be afraid to be personal. Two more scripture passages and we'll close tonight. Every man has to make his own decision. We cannot make it for them. Look at, first, uh, look at Colossians 1 with me, please. Colossians 1. <clears throat> Colossians 1.28 says, Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Listen, every individual matters. We need to be personal. A shotgun approach, and you know, when you're preaching the gospel or like, like what Peter did on Pentecost when he preached to all those thousands of people, there's times and places for that. But listen, we're going to reach people when we're personal with them. And we realize that every single person has to make a choice to either receive or reject Christ. So every man is important. Final verse tonight, Romans 14, and we're done. Romans 14. One of the most sobering verses, I think, in the Bible. Romans 14, 12. Sobering and overlooked, discounted, forgotten. Romans 14, 12 says... So then, every one of us shall give account of himself to God. It's a personal issue. Every man is going to give an account of himself, of himself to God. We have to listen. And we need to be ready. Questions are not an attack on the truth. They're an opportunity to share the truth. We need to be ready to share the truth. Not the feel good, but the good news of Jesus. And finally tonight, we have to be willing to be personal. Heart to heart. Individual to individual. Center to center. Sharing the gospel. If you'd stand with me please and our musicians would come. We'll come for a time of invitation. Well tonight we saw a different perspective we saw Jesus dealing with a man who was a sinner, but he didn't look like a sinner. He looked like he had it all together. But the truth of the matter is, everyone needs Jesus. Some will be hardened to the gospel because they have no physical needs and therefore think they have no spiritual needs. But they still need the Lord. So where are we tonight? <clears throat> tonight, how has the Holy Spirit spoken to your heart? Are we offended by questions from the lost or the skeptical? Tonight, let's change our perspective and change our heart. And instead of seeing it as an attack on the truth and what we hold to be true, seeing it as an opportunity to share Jesus. And we need to, in order to do that, we need to know why we believe what we believe. I wonder tonight, do we know why? Do we know what we believe? That's fine. But do we know why we believe what we believe? How's God dealing with us on that tonight? Number two, are we more excited about church and being good than we are about Jesus? Let's remember, he's our first message. He's the only one who can save. And finally, do we take time to see individuals as a soul, just like you and I are a soul that's on our way to an eternity? Do we see them as a person, an individual who needs Christ? So tonight, as we have a hymn of invitation, let's do business with God.